Today we're going to talk about categorical logic. Uh, we're working on Chapter 7 in Dr. Vaughn's book, The Power of Critical Thinking. And we're going to still be talking about deductive reasoning all the way through Chapter 7, but we're going to talk about a different kind of deductive reasoning called categorical logic. And I'm going to write on the board a lot, so, you know, normal stuff. Categorical logic. Okay, it's still deductive. So we still have our CBS stuff. Uh, we still have conclusive evidence, valid or invalid structure, and we still have sound or failed reasoning, okay, as far as our content or truth goes. And we're still working with definite things, conclusive, all of that kind of fun stuff, but we're also talking about the way categories of things interact with each other. Eventually, we're going to get to Venn diagrams, a little bit different from truth tables. Um, our truth tables in Chapter 6 were very precise, um, and we have a lot of information that goes into those truth tables, things that happen that um, we can quantify very, very precisely. It's either true or false, and that's it. With categorical logic, we're looking at smaller bits of information when we look about sentence structure and that kind of thing, but we're looking at bigger categories, hence categorical logic. Okay, So categorical logic is looking at categories of things and their relationships. And the way we get at that is by looking at specific, specific categorical statements and the relationships inside those statements. Okay, So we have this idea of contingent parts. Okay, Our statements have four possibilities. Okay. Sounds like a theme in logic, right? We had four different possibilities for our truth tables. Now, in categorical logic, we have four different possibilities for our um, categorical statements. So, when we're talking about these statements and classes, we're talking about big things, okay? Um, most of the time. Sometimes we talk about itty bitty things, but they're still talking about a category. Not necessarily individuals, although some categories just have one member. Um, but we're talking about the kinds of things like Dr. Vaughn has in the book, um, what we're going to go with as far as our example, is all cats are carnivores. Okay, Whether it's a you know, domestic short hair you have at home or a lion, they all like to eat meat. Okay? And that's our kind of running thing. In our kind of setting this up, and I'm looking at page 231, and moving on from there, we have standard forms of categorical statements, okay? Those are our four pieces, and we're going to label them A-E-I-O, okay? Alpha, Omega, Epsilon, Iota. Um, and we have some interesting things to go with that. So my contingent parts, I'm talking about statements, and I'm talking about a little bit at this point of translating anything we have that talks about category, categories into these proper, very formal statements, okay? Very precise. It's deductive logic. We like precision, okay? So we have four different pieces, and I'm going to kind of give myself a little bit more room here. Um, our four pieces, we have a quantity or, and a quantifier. We have a subject term, and I know this sounds very much like um, English grammar, but we're going to work with this. We have a copula, and we have a predicate term. None of this is hard, okay? It's just these are our vocabulary. And that's really what we're going to talk about today on this particular um, lecture, is we're just going to look at how this stuff gets set up. And then on the 7B lecture, we'll actually put it into practice a little bit more. Okay, So we have a quantifier, we have a subject term, we have a copula, and we have a predicate term. All of these translate pretty easily. Okay, In our quantity, we have four choices. All, well, we have three choices, but it's going to get interesting. All, none, and some. Okay, that's it. In our subject term, these always have to be noun. Nouns or noun phrases, clauses, 
okay? The noun and its contingent stuff, adjectives and all that kind of fun stuff. The copula is our bridge or our arch, really, and this is our to be verb. Usually, this is an R, A R, not any of those other ones. Predicate term again, nouns and noun phrases. I can write, I really can, and I didn't bring one of those guys, so I'm going to have very mean hands with over that. It's okay. Okay? Now, I'm actually going to make this a little bit smaller so I can use the rest of my board space here. So, all, none, some. Okay. You know, in um, deductive logic, we like the all and none. We like to be very precise. Um, we like all or nothing because that means we're definite. But in this case, we can use some and still be definite. Okay, and I'll show you how that works in a little bit. So we have our four pieces, okay? And we have four kinds of statements, four kinds of um, standard forms that fit in this, okay? And I'm going to write a bunch of stuff here, and hopefully the camera will get all of it, okay? So our first one, all cats are carnivores. Okay? That's our format. Now, we can say this in lots of ways, but this is the translation down to the standard form. Okay, I'm going to add some things to this in just a minute here. Okay, so all cats are carnivores. No cats are carnivores. I had a roommate once who tried to make her cat a vegetarian. Um, that did not work out very well. Okay. Then we have some cats are carnivores. And then we have some cats are not carnivores. Okay, these are our four standard forms. Okay, all, no, some, and some are not. And we can do this with any kind of categorical statement we end up with. Um, every categorical statement we end up with has to fit in one of these. And when it fits in one of these, it's the same thing. Remember back in truth tables, we had the idea that every time we see a P or Q, it works the same. Okay, it has certain attributes, it has certain restrictions. Same thing here. Now we know, because, you know, English, um, tends to be a little bit odd and complicated. So that's why we have to translate a bit. Sometimes we have to translate a lot, but all the time it's going to end up in one of these formats. Okay, now we're going to add in, well actually we're going to translate a little bit into these other standard forms where we're using variables. Okay, and this time the variables actually mean something. So it's very good. Our subject term is always an S. Our predicate term is always a P. Easy peasy, right? So instead of all cats are carnivores, because we have lots and lots and lots of possibilities for our categories here, this actually translates to all S are P. I'm going to put this over here so we have less space here. All S are P. This one, no S are P. Some S, I should have had more space here, some S are P, and then some S are not. Okay, those are our tiny translations. Okay, these are our standard form translations. Now, it's all introduction stuff. Um, I'm looking at the, still looking at the first section of chapter 7. And when we get to this point, when we get down here to the all SRP, no SRP, some SRP, some SR not P, we have our four standard forms. And these are the forms that any categorical statement can get put into. Remember back modus ponens and all of those guys for the P's and Q's? Same idea, slightly different format. Okay. Now, these things also have names. Remember, you know, modus ponens and stuff. 
these are four different names, obviously, and then we have our AEIO. Okay, so I know I love colors, and you guys probably get tired of that, but I don't. So here we go. When I'm looking at the all SRP, okay, this is a universal because it's an all, and it's an R here, so it's a, an affirmative. Remember, that's just a yes. And this is a letter A. This is an alpha. Um, this is the first. Okay? No cats or carnivores. No SRP. It's also a universal. But it's a universal negative because of this no. And that's our E. Our epsilon. Lots of colors. Pretty colors. Okay? Now when I get down here to the sum... This is not a universal anymore. I'm not talking about the whole category. I'm only talking about pieces of it. So sum is a particular. Okay, we're just looking at parts of it. Particular affirmative. And that's our iota. That's an I. Okay, and then the not, you can guess, is a particular negative. And that's our O, our omega. Okay? So our first one is alpha. Our last one is omega. Very Greek. Um, copula is also a Greek term. Um, so we have some ideas here about Greek logic. Um, four different parts. A, E, I, O. We don't have a U, um, but that's okay. Um, we have these four standard forms. We can translate any categorical statement into one of these forms, and then it's going to behave the way that form behaves all the time. Okay? Um, deductive logic, very regular, very precise. Um, English is what messes it up, so we're going to play with the translations quite a bit. Um, especially in the first set of homework, I'm having you do quite a bit from 7.1 through 7.3 to practice. Okay? Um, Practice is good, as you found out with the truth tables. So this is the first part of this. Okay, um, I'm going to erase my agenda over here because I need to give myself some space. And I don't think I have an eraser. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we're about to get dirty. So that's what I get for coming into a different room than normal to do this. Blah. Okay. The reason I raised that is because we have some very interesting ways of putting this out, okay? Um, if you're following along in the book, you have a little bit of um, review notes at the top of 237. This is in the fifth edition. And the terms here are very important. We're always looking at singular statements. And what this means is you have one subject and one predicate, and that's it. Now, we know in English we talk in very complex, very complicated sentences, and sometimes we have to break those apart and make them sound very um, immature, okay? Not in the, the rudeness factor, but in the idea that every subject has to have a predicate. Every predicate has to have a subject. And so sometimes it gets kind of redundant sounding, all cats are carnivores, all dogs are carnivores, some fish are carn carnivores, um, no plants, well, can't say that. Some plants are carnivores, some plants are not carnivores. All of those, we would say all cats, dogs, um, fish, whatever, are carnivores. And so we'd have to break that sentence apart into three separate pieces in order to kind of work with it. So be aware that sometimes our translations make things less complex, Sometimes they make it more complex. But just remember, every subject has to have its own predicate. Every predicate has to have its own subject. We can't swoosh them together. Um, so when we get these four pieces here, our universal affirmative, universal negative, particular affirmative, particular negative, we can also show this relationship through the Venn diagram. Okay, And a Venn diagram is basically two or three circles overlapping, showing the relationships among two categories. And just like in our truth tables, we only do two at a time. 
Now, we may have three sentences, and we can put that on three different, you know, bubbles, for lack of a better word. Um, but we're only going to look at two at a time. Okay, we're only going to look at two relationships at a time. One more thing. On page 239, um, Dr. Fawn has given us a lovely little thing, let us count the ways, um, further thought bubble. And it gives us some very handy ways to translate each kind of these four sentences, okay? So if we have, instead of all SRP, we have every general is a leader. Well, when I say every, really what I'm saying is all generals are leaders, all S's are P's, okay? So it's a, it's a nice little list of some very common ways we look at, um, common ways we express these four different types. Um, so when you're working on the homework, this is going to be a really good page to have marked. Sort of like that page 202 with the if-then pieces, so this is helpful. Um, I'm going to move past that into the diagramming categorical statements. Um, so this is that little piece. It starts on page 242. And really, what we're looking at are four standard ways to diagram the relationships between these two, um, these two pieces. And Dr. Vaughn gives us some very good um, details and stuff um, on each of them. If you look on page 244, though, there's a box, the four basic categorical statements, and that, i got to get back in the camera here, hold on. That is what we're going to put on our card, okay? Um, what we're going to put on the card, this card, are the four pieces written out with our AEIO, and that way we can have them for our um, for our use as we're going along. So we don't have to always come back to page 244. Um, it's a little bit helpful. So I'm looking at, and I'm going to put them up here in my little space, and you're going to have to just kind of work with me on this one. My A, okay, is all S R P. Can you see that? Yeah, can. Okay. I'm going to draw my two circles. I'm not an artist and I can't draw a straight line, let alone two circles. But there you go. They have to overlap, make a little eyeball thing here in the middle. S is always on the left, P is always on the right. Okay? Now, one of the things that's kind of weird about this is that we're shading the part that's empty. And I know that's a little counterintuitive, but here's how I kind of justify it in my own little head. Um, if I'm looking at, so I'm looking down on a hotel floor, and you know they always have that wild carpet, right? It's weird designs, whatever, so that they, you can't really tell when it's dirty. Um, I'm looking down, and I've got two circles on the floor, and got a bunch of friends who are helping me out, because I have good friends that way. One side, the S side, are all people who love sailboats, okay? The P side are all people who love paddle boats, okay? And so when they're standing around down in my two little circles, two big circles, um, I can see bits of the floor, not in other places. Well, if I say, okay, all of you folks who say you love sailboats, you also really love paddle boats, okay? So I want you to stand in that section where you can be in both, okay? So all of my S, all of my sailboat people are also paddleboat people. So they're going to fill up this middle section here so tight that I can't see the floor. They're getting out of this section, and so I can, I can see the floor here. I can see the pattern on the floor, and that's why I have color there. That's why I have a pattern there. So that's my thing. I can see the floor. It's empty, so I color in the floor. Might not be helpful for you, but it's helped me through a lot of logic classes, so I thought I'd pass that along. Okay, so that's my diagram for all SRP. Okay? My E says no SRP. So I have my two circles. Okay? And so I tell my sailboat people. Okay, none of you guys like paddle boats. You all have to stay in your own S place. 
And so they fill up this spot, and the middle part is empty. Okay, I can see the floor in there, so I get to color it in. Hopefully that's making a little bit of sense. The I sentence, some SRP, okay, and I always run out of space when I do this, so sorry about the I's and the I's and O's. Some SRP. Now, okay, over here, I have this empty spot, so I can see the floor in my all. In my sum, I've got folks here, there, and yonder, okay? But I know that at some means at least one, okay? But not all and not none, so at least one. So I make a little X. There's at least one sailboat person here that also likes paddle boats, so the X goes in the middle. Now, there may be 100 Xs in there, but there's at least one, so that's what we mark. Same kind of thing for my O. Some S are not P. Draw my circles. S and P, salt and pepper. And now I have at least one person out here who's not a paddleboat person. Okay? So one S, at least one. Now there may be a hundred here. There may be nobody in this section, but at least one person is over here. That's, that's my X, okay? So I have, if I, if I lay them all together, I have an outside, an inside, an inside, an outside. My advice to you, make the card, okay? Roll this backwards a little bit, find a little card thing, or just look on page 244 and make yours accordingly, okay? And this is the chapter seven card. What you're gonna do for exercises 7.4 and 7.5 is to look at these pieces, look at all of these four ideas, and decide which one fits the statement that you're given. Okay? Now in 7.5, you're going to look at two different statements, and you're going to draw them out. Okay? I promise it'll be much easier this way. Draw your circles and see if they look alike. If they match, they're equivalent. If they don't match, they're not. And that's going to be very important for when we get to actually doing the arguments with bent diagrams, uh, because what's on the page is the only thing we get to use, much like the truth tables. Um, it's not our emotional involvement here, remember. It's just what's on the page. And so there's a little bit of interesting there. Okay. So all SRP. I can see the floor here. They're all crowded here in this middle section. Okay? No SRP. Nobody's in the middle section. Okay? Some S, at least one. Some S are not. At least one out here. Okay? So you have a little bit of practice to do. Um, practice, practice, practice. Come back and look at this again if you need to. Um, obviously, you can always email me if you have questions and such. Um, but practice. Spend some time with this and make sure that you're pretty solid on this. It'll make the next half of the chapter very much easier. Okay? Um, let me know if you have questions. Happy day. I want to remember that this is not a touch screen.